village of Down Ampney on the 12th of October, 1872. Now, there's his father and there's his mother, and that's the little church where he was vicar. But he died when Rafe was two years old, and they went to live, that's Rafe, his mother, brother and sister, to his grandfather's house there, Leith Hill Place. And it was there that his aunt Sophie began to teach him music. They had a lot of servants, I see all those people. Mm. And the first piece of music he wrote, I think it was either four years old or six, I can't remember, and it was called The Robin's Nest. And it was written for the piano. There's various members of the family, and there's Rafe himself. That was in 1876, four years old. He wore a skirt there, you see, as boys did, and long hair. And he went to school, like everyone else, and went into trousers and cut his hair. And there he is playing the violin in school. He used to play it, there's his school, he used to play it in the dormitory at night when they were supposed to be asleep. And uh, one day the masters came in and saw the boys dancing to Rafe playing the violin. They all got into trouble. Uh, there are three little pictures of him. There he is growing up. He went away to university, went to Cambridge, got his degree in history and music. There are some of his friends in Yorkshire. See him leaning on his croquet mallet. he just come back from his honeymoon. And that's his young wife, Adeline, playing the cello. And there are four nice pictures of her. Pretty, isn't she? Mm. That was in 1908. She was very unfortunate because she couldn't play the cello for long because she had arthritis, that's a disease. Makes you go very stiff in your hands, very painful. And she became very ill and could hardly move. And Rafe had to look after her. And she finally died. Ah, now that's a funny place, isn't it? Mm. That's the Royal College of Music. That's where he began to learn about music. It's now the College of Organists near the Albert Hall. And he was taught by a man called Parry. There's Parry, who was very good at choral music. Rafe wrote quite a bit of choral music when he was a youngster. And he was also taught by Stanford. They were all influenced by this man, Brahms. You've heard his music. It's very nice. Listen. Very nice and very German, but not something you'd want to listen to every day of the week. And by the turn of the century, people were beginning to say, where's our own music? That's enough of old Brahms. Give us something fresh. of the Sea Symphony by Ray Vaughan Williams. In the early years of the century, Italy had Verdi and Puccini, Russia had Tchaikovsky, Germany had Wagner, Brahms, Schumann, and it was the German music which rather filled the world of the English musicians. And one of the liberating influences were the words of Walt Whitman. Holst used him, Delius too, and for Rafe he was a major breakthrough and the perfect text for his choral symphony. I think probably it's the first choral symphony ever written. He used the exploration of the world, the sea, the ships, all brave sailors, but it was more than that. It became also that everlasting fairy tale, man's journey towards the unknown. And it has a joyful and exciting feeling about somewhere there is something more. Cut. Thank you, Ursula. It's a wrap, everyone. Next location, off to the top. Oh, terrific. All right, that's really good.
good. That was Ursula, Ray Formillion's second wife and later his biographer. Shakespeare saw seven ages in man. We're exploring the nine symphonies, the nine ages of Rafe Fawn Williams. Did I remember everything that time, Jerry? Did I get it right? Well, most of it, but I think you were going to say that it was his first symphony and that he conducted its premiere on his 38th birthday, the Leeds Choral Society, weren't you? Oh, yes, goodness, yes. and the whole choral tradition, because he was Paris pupil at the Royal College of Music, and through Paris we go back to the great choral tradition through Purcell, back to the Elizabethans, Talis indeed, to Talis. Is that OK? Pfizer, yep, fine. Uh, what did that relate to, Ursula, going out of the cave? Well, she was remembering Vaughan Williams escaping from the ghost of Brahms. Ah, and now we're going to do her coming back into the cave. What will that relate to, then? I'll, I'll tell you later. The Sea Symphony put Vaughan Williams on the map. It breathed fresh life into a dying Victorian tradition. And although an agnostic, he also started airing out the churches. In 1904, Rafe was asked to be music editor of a new hymn book. He accepted and had a great deal of research to do, looking for tunes. He found settings by Thomas Tallis, 16th century metrical hymns. And one of these he used when he was writing his fantasia for strings on a theme of Thomas Tallis. He conducted the first performance here in this cathedral just about five weeks before he conducted the first performance of his first symphony, a sea symphony. Green sleeves, well, green sleeves. That was a tune known, I think, as far back as the time of Henry VIII. It was much favoured by the ladies of the time, more or less, a national anthem. It was certainly known to Shakespeare, and it was from Shakespeare that Braith learned it, I suppose. It isn't a folk song, it's a traditional song. Folk song is an oral transmission from one generation to another. And Rafe, like many of his fellow musicians in this country, Cecil Sharp, George Butterworth and others, collected folk songs early in this century, as did Bartok and Kodai in Hungary. They all realized that this was something very valuable that was disappearing in England. The Education Act had let everybody learn to read and read novels by sheet music and rather despised this music so much loved by their earlier forebears. But for Rafe and other musicians, it was a liberation. It was a part of a language which they made their own. He was influenced too, by, of course, by the Tudors, by the magical composers. But these two components came together and were part of the grammar, the idiom, that he found as the foundation 
of the work he was going to do, the language he would speak musically. Big Ben, London Symphony. Yes, when Rafe and Adeline were first married, they lived just round here. He must have heard it every day of his life. And you know, he wanted to call it Symphony by a Londoner. All noise and scurry. <laughs> Square on November afternoon, second movement. Yes, it's not exactly a symphonic poem, though. Well, I don't know. It's got a lot of naturalistic ingredients, like trams and a lavender girl crying her wares. Yes, he heard her when they were living in Chelsea. He collected the tune. Won't you buy my sweet lavender? Sixteen branches for a penny. <laughs> Those were the days. And all the beggars, you can hear them rattling the coins in their hats. That horse is harness. I bet the beggars never made such a lot of money as that. <laughs> well, it's a very beautiful sound anyway. It's a nocturne, the sounds from the strand drifting down to a listen on the embankment on a Saturday night. down the Thames so as to run one's hand over the pages in the Book of England from end to end. Rafe said the epilogue of the London Symphony is related to H.G. Wells' novel, Tono Bungay, when the hero goes down the Thames in a destroyer. England and the Kingdom, Britain and the Empire, the old prides and the old devotions glide astern. 
sink down upon the horizon. Pass, pass. The river passes. London passes. England passes. between the London Symphony and his next, the Pastoral. Rafe was 42 in 1914, but he enlisted almost immediately, war was declared. He saw active service in France near Arras, at first as a wagon orderly with the Royal Army Medical Corps. If Vaughan Williams' second symphony is known as Symphony by a Londoner, his third might well be called Symphony by a Soldier. Deeply felt, it shuns all heroics and patriotism. There's no pomp and circumstance anywhere in the music of Vaughan Williams. He hated the establishment, turned down a knighthood, and refused to become master of the Queen's music. The pastoral symphony seems like an elegy for all his friends killed in the war. symphony has its lighter moments in the scherzo. the band and there he is with corporal's privates he was just an ordinary private he was a wagon orderly driving up and down the front rescuing the wounded there he is at home on leave with his wife and uh, in this picture he's been made an officer in the royal artillery he finished the war shooting guns now, after the war he took up his old friendships again and there he is going for a walk with Gustav Holst tramping over the countryside which they often did after the Three Choirs Festival. Now there's Holst again, and another picture of Rafe in about 1920, when he was nearly 50, which brings us back to Gloucester. So you've been called many things. Oh, yeah. You know, such as... Including Mrs. Beethoven. <laughs> I won't go into that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, do you think, Mrs. Beethoven, you could... Um, while I'm setting up the playback, uh, explain to Iona why we've come back to Gloucester and the connection between the pastoral symphony and the Lark Ascending, which he's going to play in a few moments. Yes. I think it's one of time, because Rafe revised this work, which he'd written before the war, about the time in which he was writing the Pastoral Symphony after the war, 
And the lark, I think, looks back to a more serene time, long walks over the downs. You've played the lark quite often. Has it a special meaning for you? Yes, it has. I think mainly because I'm essentially a country person. I was brought up in the country, and this piece really does epitomize the English countryside at its best. I think for me it has two qualities. Uh, there is the sort of peasant uh, folk tune feeling, very earthy, but there's also um, great spiritual depth. See how they're getting on upstairs. Vaughan Williams conducting the London Philharmonic. Ursula, Fourth Symphony, 1935. Yes, Ray from Middle Life. Sir David Wilcox, you're director of the Royal College of Music, Rafe's Old College, and you've also conducted a lot of his music and performed it and recorded it. Do you see Rafe in this symphony? Yes, I think, well, in all the music which he wrote, I see VW, but it's really two VWs. There's the mystic and the visionary on the one hand, and the down-to-earth, very practical man on the other. 
I think one saw the contradiction when you looked at him, here was this enormous man with a big human frame, and yet within that frame there was a gentleness of spirit and an effervescent humour. One, three, three, take four. Evelyn Barbarolli, both you and Sir John were great friends of Rafe's, weren't you? And uh, Sir John conducted the premieres of uh, the Seventh and Eighth Symphonies with the Halle in Manchester. And of course you played his oboe concerto. Yes, I did indeed, many times, and recorded it. And you know, people scoff at this work rather. They say it's very poor of Vaughan Williams. I've never thought of that. I don't think it's perhaps, as a whole, his best work. But I do think there's some of the best of VWs in it, in the last moment. And I always love playing it. <laughs> Elizabeth McConkie, you were a pupil of Rafe's on and off from the age of 18 till the day he died. Getting back to the Fourth Symphony, what does it mean to you? I think almost more than all his other work. I think it's the greatest of his symphonies and a very great work indeed. And it made the immense impression on me from the first performance at Queen's Hall, which was a very notable occasion. And it aroused a good deal of mixed feelings among people because it was different to his earlier work and they felt it was um, ugly and incomprehensible and things of that sort, which I must say I never did. I felt it was all very great music and very self-revealing music. It had a tremendous lot of himself in it, as one would expect. The, um, the fierceness and the relaxed the amusing side as well, on Bastia's side in the skirt, and a sort of protest that is in it, I think, not the sort of things that people read into it, presages of war and so on. That I think was absolutely not in his mind at all, but I think I would say it was a protest about life, the inequalities of life, which he felt very strongly about it. He was a socialist, as you know, and I think that one does feel in it. You could hear there was war in the air. Well, the symphony is pure music, but he wrote a choral work at the same time on the theme of war and the pity of war and called it Dead and Abbas Parchem. Where do we start? Mm. Beat, beat drums. Voice in the wilderness, I'm afraid. Yes, it was. Beat, drums, beat, blue, bugles, blow. Whitman again, huh? Yes, and Whitman, like Rafe, had seen active service. Whitman was a war correspondent in the American War, the American Civil War, and he helped to look after the wounded, as Rafe did. Which brings us to the uh, Second World War and the Fifth Symphony. Yes, and the critics thought that meant peace. 
Wrong again. It's really a pilgrimage. The Fifth Symphony has a reference to Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. He wrote the incidental music for two dramatizations, one as early as 1906 for amateurs at Red Hill, and in 1942 for the BBC, with Gilgood as the Pilgrim. And by then, he wanted to write a stage work, not just incidental music. But it wasn't a possible time to contemplate new operas being performed, and the future was difficult to imagine. So some of the music he planned for Pilgrim found its way into this symphony. I was at the first performance in 1943, on Midsummer Day. The war was at its height, night raids and always battle news. But hearing that music, I think everyone felt they had reached the delectable mountains and were in sight of Bunyan's vision of the celestial city. Performed on the 21st of April 1948, the Symphony No. 6 in E minor thrilled audiences and surprised the critics. An extraordinary and unpredictable burst of creative activity for a man of 75, in which he seems to have summed up the whole of his life work, but at the same time to have directed a serene and courageous gaze into the future, to have meditated on first and last things with a grasp and profundity worthy of Beethoven. That was Desmond Shaw Taylor, the music critic. Vernon Handley, you've conducted a number of Rafe's works, quite a few with the London Philharmonic Orchestra, to whom we've been listening. What does this work mean to you? Well, as a conductor, you're always searching for the central characteristics of the composer you're working with. And as you're working a lot with Tchaikovsky and Beethoven and Brahms, you come back to Vaughan Williams and you search for, for, as I say, the central ideas that the man puts across. And there's something difficult but attractive about this composer in that he has a tremendous range. You realize as a conductor you're dealing with someone who could come from green sleeves to this violent sixth symphony, who could go from the Lark Ascending to Pilgrim's Progress, who goes from two uh, extraordinary string works, very far apart in character, the Talis Fantasia and the Partita for Double String Orchestra, to the violence of the fourth symphony. 
So as a conductor, uh, you're in somewhat of a difficult position. But of course, the more you know of this great range, the more you come to love the music. As a conductor, I can't get enough of it. It seems that the British film studios couldn't get enough of him either, and a new influence began to appear. In 1946, he scored a film called The Loves of Joanna Godden, and the following year, one of the love themes, greatly developed, found its way into the new symphony. to worry about. <laughs> it's a long time since I've seen Scott in the Antarctic. Aye, aye, aye. Best acting in the film. Their feet don't get frostbite. 
Come on, the Baltic fleet. Slowest ponies first. Rick Atkinson. Right. Go ahead. Betty! Bowers. Crean. Cherry Garrard. Evans with Snatcher. Evans is a tower of strength. Sound and as hard as ever. Wilson with Nobby. Oates with Christopher. Biggest handful of lot. And myself with Snippets. Sixteen men all told. Do you think he minded his uh, beautiful music being covered by all these crude sound effects? I think they're rather unnecessary. Well, I think he's already interested in another issue. The whole question of man trying to explore these remote places. Well, as you've said before, he was an explorer himself, wasn't he? Only he was exploring sonorities here. Yes. Trying to recreate in sound the feeling of cold and desolation and the impersonality of the Antarctic. make of it. He thought it was unprofessional of Scott to try and take five men to the pole on rations for four. <laughs> well, at least his share of the enterprise didn't end up mouldering in the vaults. No, no, no. He immediately thought of making it into another symphony, a new symphony. Great. Symphony number no. seven, Symphonia Antarctica. Premiered by Sir John Barbaroli in the Halley in Manchester on the 14th of January 1953, when Rafe was in his 80th year. A few weeks later, he and Ursula were married. Number eight, wedding bells. The wedding bells, do we hear those then? I would hardly think so, because, well, the first performance was in 56. When were you married? 53. But he did, well, he was writing it then. Uh-huh, in 53. He never mentioned that, anyway. No. <laughs> the picture of Ursula in 1938. And there's the photo of Rafe taken the same year when they first met. She'd written a libretto she wanted to um, bring to his attention. And uh, they worked on it together. And uh, their collaboration started at this point, went on to this day. Ah, here we are with Foxy again, one of his favorite cats. Loved cats, like Ursula does. 
Now there he is in the um, Leith Hill Music Festival. He conducted a lot of choral music for local people in villages and towns. And for years, maybe 50 years, every spring, he conducted these amateur singers and amateur choirs. What does amateur mean? Amateur means somebody who doesn't do it for a living. Mm. They just do it because they like doing it. And there he is, he's getting on now conducting. Still conducting in his 80s, quite fantastic. Still on, still enjoying life, going on holidays. When he was about 82, there he is with Ursula, with the Parthenon in Greece. Oh, and there he is getting on a donkey to go up to Delphi to meet the oracle. He went deaf towards the end, you know, that's a hearing aid. The oboe was the first instrument he couldn't hear, so he always had to sit in the front row. And that's where he moved to. That was the last house he lived in, in London. Very grand, isn't it? It's called Hanover Terrace. And uh, when he went there, he was about 80, 81 years old, and he was rather upset because uh, it only had a 21-year lease, and he thought he'd have to be turned out when he was 102. We're going on now. It's getting older and older. Yes, time is passing. There he is at the festival hall on his 85th birthday. Everyone cheering and shouting, many happy returns. And there's his birthday cake, and there he is with Ursula again. And there's Ursula with me. We're approaching the end of the journey now, and um, we haven't actually talked about your involvement in Rave's music. I was more or less writer in residence. We started with a collaboration on a mask. I did one number for Pilgrim, a big choral work for the School's Music Association, one of the madrigals for the Garland for the Queen, and some of Hodier. I got used to being asked to do things by yesterday. And he set some verse I'd written. One was based on our reading of T.E. Lawrence's translation of the Odyssey. I wrote my words and left them on his desk. When I came back from gardening, I found he'd almost finished the song. It's about Menelaus after the Trojan War, a promise that eventually he will go home and Helen will at last be his. He started work on his Ninth Symphony when he was 84, finished it in about a year. 
it had a sort of program at the beginning to do with Salisbury, with Salisbury Plain, where he had so often walked with friends, where he had done part of his military training, and thoughts of Hardy's Tess of the D'Urbervilles, who spent her last night of freedom here at Stonehenge. One of the very first folk songs he collected was called Salisbury Plain, 1904. That's right. It was a girl who loved a highwayman who came to a bad end. I remember he ended up in Newgate Jail, the highwayman, and she was waiting day after day for that horrible tolling bell which would announce his death. And in the ninth, in the second movement, I think there is such a bell. Yes, there is. <laughs> had a childhood memory of a bell. They were driving back from a children's party in a carriage at night. He asked his mother what it was, and she said it was the passing bell. They ring it for people who die, a number of strokes for each year of their lives. So his first intimation of death came to him as a small child and through music. It's all there, isn't it? His love of folk song, the Tudor poets and composers, our history, architecture, the landscape and its people, the sea, and the unknown, the past, present, and future, all incredibly concentrated in this last great visionary work. It has no air of finality. It seems more like the beginning of a new exploration. And perhaps that is how all journeys should end. <laughs> And that was the last symphony he ever wrote, Symphony Number no. 9. He heard it here in the festival hall just before he died, mm. April 1958. It's a swan song. What swan song? Well, a swan song means different things to different people. Just before it dies, a swan begins to sing. Now, some people hear it as a sad song because the swan's unhappy at losing its life and friends. Other people think the song's a happy one because the swan's glad to be meeting God. Now, Rafe didn't know whether he believed in God or not, but he certainly knew that no creature in pain ever sings. <laughs> 